I think I had to understand where the staff are coming from and understand that they have a different work ethic potentially to myself. Um, I mentioned that I messaged them before five in the morning. Not that I ever crack the whip or anything like that. I'd like to think I don't. I've got to understand that people have got other things to do rather than work. So you've got, you've got to understand you're not going to get a response at that time. Yeah. Um, and trust the staff as well. Trust the staff. That's the reason that we employ them. That's the reason that we do so long of induction period with them that we've got to trust that they know what they're doing. And and they do. Um, therefore, I honestly, hand in heart, say we've got some of the best staff that we've ever had. And our office team is the best office team we've have ever had. And coincidentally, it's the youngest office team we've ever had. So it's putting the trust in them as well. Before, we're always, oh, we need to get someone that's got all this experience kind of thing, which is fine. But right now, we've got the youngest office team we've ever had. And they're so good. It's so efficient in, in what they do. From Coordinate Sports, it's The Drive Phase, a show about sports founders, leaders, and experts, and the stories behind their business journeys. Our guest this episode is Rob Sherwood, founder and director of Get Active Sports. Rob launched Get Active with the mission to use his passion for sport to inspire and impact as many children as possible. We discuss Rob's journey from starting the business to the chance meeting that led to a merger of three companies into one and the expansion across the region. A focus on recruiting and training quality staff and implementing processes across the business has allowed them to scale and build what is now a group of eight companies, all focused on working with children and young people to achieve a positive impact. Enjoy the show. Okay, really excited to welcome Rob Sherwood, founder and director of Get Active Sports. Um, companies providing activities to over 10,000 children every week and um, delivering more than 9,000 activities monthly. Welcome to the show, Rob. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no, we've been looking forward to this. What we normally do when we start out the show is just trying to get a, paint a picture of kind of who you are, a bit of your background, get the listeners to get to know you a little bit better. So you were born, born I guess, born and raised down in Reading, in Woking, yeah, area, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so and, and raised down here. Always, my passion has always been sport. Any single sport, football, cricket, rugby, hockey, basketball, tennis, whatever it is, I like to play it. I couldn't sit still, never being able to sit still. I was always out doing something. And yeah, lived down here in my life, apart from when I went to university for three years, which was in Manchester, which surprisingly enough was better. So in, in those early years when you're doing all, all different types of sport, was that kind of fostered through your family or were they, were they really sporty as well? Or was that you know, any role models? Yeah, uh, not massively, but relatively sporty. Um, my sister wasn't in the slightest and had no interest in it, so we were complete polar opposites with regards to what we were doing when we were younger. But yeah, it was just always, if I wasn't playing for an actual sports team, I was out with my mates kicking a ball around in some form. All my mates lived fairly close together as well, where when you were younger, it was a decent area, so we could just go out and play till whenever, when dinner time was, so to speak. But yeah, it's constantly playing sports all through school, primary school, secondary school, playing for as many sports teams as possible. What do you think it was like in primary? Obviously, we're going to touch on it now. A lot of your, I guess, career, business career, a lot of companies working in uh, activities for, for kids. What was your experience of primary school like? I'll compare, I guess we're going to compare it to now, but how did you, being a sporty kid in school, how was that? I loved it in the fact that at break, lunchtime, we can just play as much sport as we possibly could. To be honest, I don't remember doing a lot of PE at primary school. I really don't remember this. There was nothing structured there that I can remember. More of the sport when I was really young was around your local, you know, under eights, under nines teams that I used to play for. Um, I think I can remember maybe two or three football matches I played, like representing the school when you played another primary school. But, but that was it. Um, the school that I went to, which is only around the corner from where I live now, they're massive on sport now, to be fair to them. So when I was younger, I just don't think it was something that was mainly focused on it was more the, the reading literacy numeracy kind of thing that was more of the focus to be honest yeah definitely similar to myself I mean there's it was like we had one teacher who was super sporty and loved cricket so my school was like really good at cricket went to all the like, regional national finals but I think if they weren't there it probably wouldn't have been on the agenda at all so yeah I don't remember any teachers that were massively on sport but I think they taught us a little bit but it's just I haven't got the best memory anyway, but I just don't remember doing much sport at primary school. It was all outside of school time, to be honest. And like after school clubs like there is now, like some schools do two or three after school clubs every single day. I don't remember really doing them. Holiday clubs I did, and they're all football ones, but I don't remember doing any after school stuff. And then obviously primary school into secondary and you went up to Manchester University. Yeah, I went on Manchester University. So secondary school was when sport not became a profession, but it got really really interesting because I went to um, it was a public school but it was a uh, boys school um, so they were massive on sport uh, the head teacher was massive on sport and to be honest 
they were good at sport. I still think they're pretty good now. So had the opportunity to represent the school at rugby, cricket, athletics, basketball, literally at every sport I tried to represent them. Whether I was brilliant or not, I don't know. I represent them as much as I could. That's when I really, really, really got into sport and joined more clubs outside of school as well. That boys' school mentality as well. I went to a boys' school as well. It's almost like, so, I guess, social status within the school. Do you know if you... Yeah, I know. It's um, the American thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but I don't think it's not really jocks, but it seems to get you out of some scrapes as well with teachers. I mean, if you're good at sport, you almost get a lot of free pass. Free pass, then you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can miss lessons as well sometimes, couldn't you, if there was a match? Yeah, it's important get, Yeah, important tournaments coming up and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Would I be right in saying, like, football is your first passion in terms of all the sports? I mean, cover all the sports. Is it a football focus? My main passion, I wouldn't say I was brilliant at it. I was all right. I was probably better at cricket and potentially rugby, but football was my main passion. Um, I still play it now to a really poor standard, but I still play it. Um, but I don't. the only other sport I play now is golf. Football is my main one, yeah. And um, so in terms of university, what did you study in Manchester then? Was it sports? Sports exercise and coaching, which I did three years of and absolutely loved it. It was amazing. We've talked about quite a lot, but in terms of the, the degree and the practical element of the degree, did you get into coaching at that point or was it before then that you... I was really coaching a little bit before then, um, just helping out at the leisure centre with like holiday club schemes, but that was kind of an involuntary basis. So I was still getting involved a little bit. Not a great deal then. At university, I didn't coach as an employed status, but there was obviously a lot of coaching on the course. But surprisingly to me, I was a bit disappointed in the fact that there was uh, a lot more... Well, there wasn't much practical at university. There's a lot more lectures and stuff like that. I wanted to go out and do some forms of activity. And it wasn't as much as people like to think. I know that looking on the outside, anybody that does a sports degree, it's kind of, well, you just ran around for three years, didn't you? But, mm, uh, I had to do quite a bit in the end. And it does get quite tricky, some of the courses. Yeah, and I think we'll talk about employability as well. And we're going to touch on your apprenticeship programme. You've got to run it, get active. But almost, uh, I don't know, something that's a lot of unis are a bit more progressive with now. But that degree and that academic status didn't really or doesn't really set someone up for a sports coaching career in a lot of, a lot of times when no. essentially you might come out of university for three four year degree without any industry standard quals basically you need to go back to go back to the scratch again um, same as the fitness industry you've got to go back and get qualified exactly that and with the coaching as well if with what we do working with children and young adults you don't actually get any experience of doing that all the coaching is done with your peers 18 to 20 years old who are all well behaved they're all there for the same reason so active looking a little bit further ahead we've had interviews of people that have got brilliant cvs or you know exercise coaching degree and we're like oh, this person's going to be brilliant they turn up and the kids just run right kind of thing because they don't have any actual experience of working in schools or working with younger children which is a completely different ball game to teaching 18 19 year olds that actually want to be there and want to improve yeah, a bit of classroom management is required as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, session management. Yes, yeah, so with um, with uni, you were coaching in there. You obviously left university and then looked at obviously working in local schools or was it straight to the football? I know you were down at Southampton for a while as well. I was at Southampton first, which was probably for a good year, which is when Gordon Strachan was there. That's how long ago it was. And it was brilliant. Um, so I worked in the academies and development centres, which again is slightly different to what we do now and the fact that everybody wanted to be there. Everybody wanted to learn and everybody wanted to improve and it was only football. So were, they, were those kids and young people you worked with, were they all invited in? Was it like scouted and so it's kind of like proper academy status, yeah? I did my level two at university as well as the actual coaching course. So that's what led me on to doing that. And then, yeah, I enjoyed it. But it was just, I thought this is going to be really hard to be make a career out of it, like ridiculously hard in the fact that I was working at these academies and, and children were getting sent away left, right and centre to different academies because they didn't think they were good enough. And then coaches were getting changed here, there and everywhere. And it just didn't seem this wasn't going to be a, a long-term career. And absolutely nothing against people that are PE teachers because they're brilliant. They do a fabulous job. But I would say maybe 70% of my peers at university went on to be PE teachers. Just they... I was going to say that degree kind of lends itself to going that well. Back then, definitely down that route was, was kind of the, the pre-ordained uh, path. A lot of them that potentially would be listening now who are still doing amazing jobs and have done brilliant careers I, there was just something in me that didn't want to be a PE teacher I don't know what it was I just didn't fancy it so that's why I went more down the coaching route and went to Southampton and to get some experience and to earn some money having come out of university and it didn't I wouldn't say it served a purpose because that sounds like I'm talking it down it was really really good but I just knew this couldn't be a long-term career for me unless I went on to doing I eventually did my UF would be but more and more qualifications and that's when I thought right let's see what's happening in schools because I knew from my time and speaking to various people who were teachers that there's very little sport going on in school 
So that's kind of when Get Active was born, so to speak. So this is pre-funding, pre-sports, sports premium, PE premium. At that point, you're, uh, it'd be interesting for some of the listeners to hear uh, in terms of how you were funding yourself. So in terms of you going to school, was it, was it parents paying? Was it the school bringing you in on a contractual basis? Yeah, so everything was parent funded. So it was breakfast clubs and after school clubs, mainly with the, the odd lunchtime club, but we didn't do many because obviously primary schools normally have one hall and they've got to feed their children. So it was normally just breakfast and after school clubs and just trying to get as many of them as I could possibly teach which obviously, if you do a quick math, is 10 a week. They're doing five breakfast clubs, five after-school clubs. So even doing that, making sure the clubs were full, really, really promoting them and, and running them to the best of my ability, made sure that those clubs constantly had enough to children in them so I could progress and develop the business. Were you always looking for that? And a lot of people a lot of, um, people might resonate in terms of that day is kind of split up, so big chunks of within the day that would be nice to have some hours in there. So you're always looking to kind of fill those with Curriculum hours, or was, did that, was that something that came later on? Obviously, different delivery style, focusing on curriculum, etc. So It came, I always knew that the schools needed that. Um, this is also before, massively before PPA cover and things like that was a thing in schools. So I always knew in my mind that schools need this. And some schools did kind of approach me and say, well, can you do a couple of hours with some children? It tends to be some children that may have struggled in class or some children gifted and talented kind of thing. Um, just seeing my coaching after school club so yeah I went in doing that and then the PPA came around through the government scheme and that's when the business really kind of took off and became not a lifestyle business whereas before just doing the after school clubs it was just kind of paying for me to go and do it at my time and making me a little bit of money and then the PPA came around and that's when it became like a, a proper business where I could employ people and they could start running sessions and that was I guess people that are in the earlier stages, that was always the, the tipping point, the chicken or the egg. Do you employ someone before you get the work or do you get the work and then employ someone kind of thing? And I was always, always under the impression that I would have to employ people and then I'd fill their diary, which is what I did. Um, so I took people on, not necessarily when they had guaranteed work, um, but I, I was always convinced I could find them something to do. Um, and I always explained to people in the early days when I stepped taken on coaching that, Coaching is, is tough. If you want to do coaching for 40, 50 hours a week, it can be done, but it's not going to happen overnight. So they had to get involved in other things. So it might be like the organisation of the other after-school clubs. They're not running, uh, helping with the promotional side, getting holiday camps ready. So there was always something else they could do until PPA came. And then it was just a continuous cycle. Yeah, I mean, also as well, if you're coming in, it can be a bit, bit of a shock as well. If you came in and you're suddenly delivering 20, 30 lessons a week, having to plan and prepare those and deliver it. Sometimes it's a better grounding to kind of come in with a few hours and build yourself up. Exactly, yeah. Uh, we're very, very strict on things like the planning, the preparing and the assessing and stuff like that. Um, that None of our staff can turn up and just try and wing it, which unfortunately we still see nowadays that people turn up and they just try and make it up at the top of their head. No, no matter how long someone's been coaching, I'm always a firm believer that you've got to plan it. Um, you've got to assess the children at the end because you'll have different children come in different weeks with different abilities. It would be impossible just to... You can spot that a mile off, I'm guessing, straight away, someone trying to, trying to blag a session or just turn up and, and work it out. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite easy to see, yeah. I'm really interested in that transition. So you've got the 10 clubs fully booked. Everyone's coming because you're the coach at that point because it's all about you. What was that transition like? trying to step away from the sessions that you'd built up. I know you're probably still delivering a bit, but that's always difficult, right, with the with the schools or the parents or the children. They're wanting Rob, right, rather than exactly your that. new coach that you're bringing on. It's the biggest challenge I find in a new business. So our franchisees that work for us, a lot of them get to this stage where they build up themselves and they're right. I need to step away because I can't be in the business. I need to work on the business. And it is tricky, but it has to be done in order to make it a larger business. If you want it as a lifestyle business, it's not a problem. Um, I don't think many people get into setting up businesses for that. So for me, it was kind of phase the new coach in. So the coach would come with me for at least a half a term so they can see how I run it. Not that I'm the greatest coach in the world because they'll have their own things they could do, but they could just see how I think it's worked from doing it. And then I just asked to replicate them. So little things that I started months and months, well, years and years ago are still in Get Active now that we still do. So things like at the end, parents come in five minutes before when COVID wasn't around and watch the presentation. So that way we can kind of explain to the children and also to the parents what they've done in that session because you tend to get a five-year-old will come and 
mum dad will pick little jack up and you're like, what did you do today and i played a match for the last 10 minutes but we did croif turn we did passing we did loads of different things for that so it's a way to kind of explain of what's been done I get that one totally i've got a five-year-old daughter and she does according to her she doesn't do anything at school every day so when i ask her i can't remember <laughs> so yeah totally understand that everywhere so we do loads of little things in order to remind the children and also to inform the parents exactly what their child or children have done during that session and um, the way that we register the children and just the way that we structure that whole thing we just we like to think that everybody copies it so that for every single get active session looks exactly the same from a child's point of view parents point of view school's point of view brilliant and it, so that standardization obviously is how you keep the quality up there as you're developing you're growing obviously ppa came in i'm assuming you had more and more schools looking for your services was there a point where we hear it a lot in our industry it's almost like referrals schools is more world with schools so if you do something well someone else is going to find out normally was that how you grew or did you actually put focus around kind of outbound marketing outbound sales at that point or was it like yeah, definitely and i guess that that's the other thing as well in terms of you know, we talk about transitioning away from the session but also maybe the relationship with the schools right so if you now you've got a sales team in the early days they're probably signing up with yourself because you've gone in and sold the company sold up the what you're all about and then you've kind of had to pass that on to pass that off on again down to someone else who's who's, able, who's got the time and able to do that yeah and you don't know whose child you're teaching like you're teaching a head teacher of a different school particularly in a holiday camp or a teacher of a different school or you know someone that's a governor or someone like that you never you never know whose child you're looking after so always do the best session you can possibly do what year is it this we're, we're talking if we go back we're talking like what 2005 six time it's about then, yeah. yeah and at that point obviously you're growing you're expanding based in in and around Reading, Wokenham area. How far did you expand from there? And I know obviously that kind of brings on to... Um... Yeah, so we started expanding into Slough and Wickham areas. And that is when the other two directors became involved, which is uh, Sean and Ryan, because they had their own businesses in those areas. And it's, it's quite funny. It was actually a, a conference, like a networking event, that um, Slough Borough Council organised for all external providers. It was kind of like a speed dating thing. So you sat at 30 seconds, you spoke to somebody else, and you just talked about what you did as a business. And me and Sean sat face to face and I spoke and he spoke and we're like, right, you do exactly the same thing as I do. And I've seen your flyers and he was obviously thinking the same and we left it as it is and I gave him my business card. And literally the next day he reached out and he spoke to me and he's like, Look, I know what you do. Um, I know your quality and I've seen some of his coaches. I knew they were, they were really, really good. And some of the stuff he did was slightly different to me in the fact that he... He focused slightly more on elite level. So he was working with Hayden Mullins, the ex-footballer. Okay, yeah, Watford, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he was working alongside him, doing some sessions. And uh, it had a very good synergy. We thought we could work together really, really well. Here. And then Ryan was a qualified teacher at the time. So he was doing what sessions he could do. Bear in mind, he's, he, he's a teacher in a primary school. And Ryan's expertise, he was the head of PE. So he knew exactly what schools needed, what schools wanted, and what needed to be done. And the sort of levels that it had to be delivered at. Um, so, yeah, we all got together and it only took about, you know, normally these things will take months and months to thrash out a deal. But I was going to say, was there any conflict? It seems like, um, this just seems like perfect, that synergy, everyone's talking, everyone's on the same page. We're all on the same right, you got right coming in with the education side, he's going to refine the sales, you know, to get into the school better. You've got an elite pathway now. Is it, is it, was it that simple or was there any conflict in terms of you're in my patch and I'm coming? It was simple. And the fact that we sat down and we said, oh, we want to make this massive. Like that was one of the first things everybody said. Like we equally, children needed this and schools needed this. So we're like, right, well, let's do it. Honestly, I reckon it probably took about six weeks to get a deal. We had no lawyers, we had no solicitors. It was just us. We sat down and we said, this is what we want to do. This is how we think we should do it. And it was all, all of us were just nodding our heads saying, yeah, 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 agreed. This is perfect. And then we launched officially all together in the summer Oh, blimey, 2008, something like that, I think it was, um, when we put everything together, brought all the staff together. And it sounds corny and we just never look back and that really is how it's gone, to be honest. It was a worry when, when we had to bring them all together, but we did it correctly in the fact that we presented them all with their contracts that, so they knew exactly what they were going to get paid, when they were going to pay, what the expectations were, what the roles and responsibilities were. And none of them looked at it and thought, oh, this is ridiculous because a lot of them were already doing it. It was just under a different brand, to be honest. And some of the part-time staff who wanted to get full-time work, it worked really well for them. In the fact that, you know, they may have had only 10 hours with Get Active, but now we've merged all together. They sit and talk about how good the coaches were and we could just fill their hours up. So a lot of them went from part-time to full-time literally overnight, which they were all delighted about. So 
it just worked well and it's worked so well that I'm sure we'll talk about it later that me, Ryan and Sean have now got eight businesses together all doing different things in schools. So Fantastic. So at that point then, when you launched 2008, what was the coverage like then? So is it still kind of Wickham Slough? Yeah, it was those sort of areas, Wickham Slough, Reading, where I am, and we had maybe 20 to 25 schools, I'd say roughly. Not a lot of schools at that time, but enough to keep 20 to 25 staff members occupied. We were probably running about seven or eight holiday camps. So it was, it was an all right size for us. It kept us all busy and we could have a couple of managers. Um, once we put it all together, that's when it quickly grew. What was that growth like at that point? Was it, and, and the other question I had was in terms of the, the makeup, obviously everyone's coming in as directors. How did you, what was the division of responsibilities essentially? So was it regional or was it based on like service areas? That everyone kind of took? For the directors, it was based on our experiences and what we felt our strengths were. So we played to our strengths. So Ryan was obviously education. Um, so everything that we did as a lesson had to have some form of education to it. It couldn't be just turn up and play a match. Um, Sean's expertise at the time were coaching and mine were all regards to the finances. So I kind of slowly stepped away from the schools in the fact that I didn't see them on a regular basis because I, I was mainly there whenever it was contract renewals or they needed to talk about something. Sean and Ryan were there you know, on a more regular basis assessing the staff, supporting the staff. Um, and stuff like that so yeah yeah definitely so in terms of your stuff as well are they what's your model that business was is it everyone's employed or are they freelance or how, how does, right every single Brilliant. person for us is employed so therefore they know where they stand and we know where they, everybody stands so it's just clear therefore they, it all goes through a, a payroll company and things like that so it just makes it a lot easier for the staff that they know yeah and i think that's a that's an ad that's a, an attraction as well when you're recruiting people especially in the industry there's a lot maybe working freelance or maybe not have a, um, secure hours etc so if you're taking that commitment on board and especially what's happened in the last year to 18 months that people are employed so yeah definitely and it's sad that in terms of like yeah, the other support that's there if they're not employed they couldn't access it as much as obviously fellow scheme etc et et so right, great so in terms i've got one question i know noticed on your on your website you've got some ambassadors so i'm just interested in how they came on board or at what point did they come on board for the organization so um daniela brown who's the paralympian was a contact that i had with regards to a different business i do in property so i think she came in to do some motivational speaking for one of my friends and he kind of said well you need to speak to this woman she's brilliant and again it was a very very i wouldn't say a sale but an easy conversation that we spoke about what we did our values and she her values aligned with with us and the way she, she speaks and what she's gone through in her story and the fact that she was an able-bodied athlete then literally overnight she was a paralympian and how she went on to win all these gold medals in the olympics and world champs it was it's just inspiring and she inspires all the children when she comes in to talk um so she's really 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 good that's what i was going to ask in terms of their engagement is it is that what it is so they the ambassadors are coming in and doing assemblies and yeah they, and sessions. yeah so they come around and do so Daniela focuses more on the assemblies. Darren's come in before to do assemblies and to also do, not coaching, but to do some little training sessions with the children alongside our staff, which I absolutely love. Um, again, Darren's um, Darren was actually directly through. So that's, Dar- yeah, so that's Darren Campbell. Darren Campbell. Olympic gold medal, yeah. So he, I just thought he was speaking. It was it's really strange. He was speaking to Amir Khan through Twitter, uh, direct, and they were talking about how they want to engage in children, how they get involved in the community. And it was it was open for everybody to see, which I thought well, that was brilliant. So I literally just sent him a message on Twitter about what we did. And then okay. he sent me his number straight up. Then we had a conversation. And again, it just clicked. And the values that he has with regards to inspiring children, particularly children that come from disadvantaged families or broken homes kind of thing, just worked really well. And, and I, I don't know if you've seen him on TV or seen him talk, how passionate he is about absolutely everything and the bundles of energy he has. When he goes into schools, everybody listens and everybody's engaged in what he's saying. And then he pulls out his gold medal and everybody wants to know exactly how he's how he's got that gold medal, what he's overcome in his life. And it's just something different that we can bring to the children because obviously with a lot of our sessions, if we work at a school where we're only doing an after-school club, for example, there's going to be 80% of the children that we won't work with. But the fact that we bring Darren, our ambassadors in, or some of our staff in to come and talk to them assembly means that we can speak to every single child. Um, not that we're trying to get them onto our club. We're just trying to engage them, help motivate them, and see what can happen if they really try their hardest, really, to be honest. Exactly. A little bit of inspiration. I mean, talking about disadvantaged pupils as well, I know it's, it's uh, common at the moment, the level of free school meals has 
um, eligible children just increasing massively. And I know you've been involved um, in the half program in Easter and probably will be again in, in summer. So what's the kind of your scope? I know we, we were talking earlier off camera around how you're um, being able to scale for that. Cause I mean, like you've got local authorities crying out for your services and it's, it's, it's a, I guess it's a bit of a, a big challenge. I don't know if it's a recruitment challenge or what, but how, yeah, how are you going about um, tackling that? And there's definitely a lot of listeners um, here who'll be, who'll be wanting to get involved in it and see how you've done it. So it's, it's definitely been a challenge, but equally it's been amazing to see the children that wouldn't normally attend one of our holiday clubs attendant and the parents as well, that they've got some respite and they know that their child's safe and doing something active and they're also getting a, a free meal in the days. Amazing. So it's a brilliant scheme and it is so good. And it's exactly what, I'm not a politician, but it's exactly what I think the children in this country needed. And the amount of children that need it. So, for example, Reading Borough on its own, I think there was just over 7,000 children that are eligible for it, which is scary when you think that's just one small borough in the whole of England. Yeah, increasing all the time as well. Yeah. I, I, think we got, I think we got about 3,000 children from Reading come in the end, which was really good considering we had two weeks to promote it or everybody not just us the, the local authority had two weeks to promote it um but yeah as, as you showed the recruitment has been tricky but not impossible we just had to be clever with how we did it for example i know the children have to come for four hours a day so we did four hours in the morning four hours in the afternoon two different sets of children so therefore the staff could work the whole way through which the local authority were fine with the children had lunch when they finished or had lunch when they arrived or dinner at the end either or um and that way more children come and access the services and it's easy for us to recruit. Um, but yeah, recruitment's the hardest thing. But then there's so many people that still want to work in the holidays. So we had qualified teachers, we had TAs, HLTAs, even lunchtime controllers we had supporting us. And then you've got the students as well who come back from university who are available. We've got enough staff in the end. I think this summer's going to be really, really tricky. We're going to have loads and loads of children. But, yeah. you know, as, as long as... Everybody's organised, which is, I, I think we're going to talk about it later, which is my main point in business is organisation, organisation. That's all I ever talk about my staff. As long as you're organised, then you'll find those staff. Don't try and find those staff two weeks before the summer holiday because you've got absolutely no chance and everything else. Yeah, exactly. Out. Get them adverts out now. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, just in terms of one area that a lot of providers might be a bit nervous about is the kind of the food offering. Can you expand a little bit on how you went about that? Was that yeah. something that was central from the council or did you? Yes. Yeah, so so um, one local authority sorted it all out for us. So they just said, that these are the people you're using. They'll come and actually do some cooking with the children as well. Oh, brilliant. Which was really, really good. But, you know, most of the uh, local authorities are very much like you've got to sort it out and it's got to be a hot meal as well, which made things really, really tricky. But we outsourced it. So, again, as soon as we knew this was coming in, uh, we started speaking to schools to ask who their contacts are with regards to their meals, where they get their food from. And then we just found a, a local company based in Reading who could cook the food to the standards that are needed. It arrives at the right temperature, has all the right ingredients for it and uh, dietary requirements. and they delivered it to all our sites. So they were really, really good. There are plenty of caterers out there that we've spoken to since that would actually have done that job for us as well. Um, right. So, yeah, I would just try and speak to your local schools and find out who they use for their catering. The school catering, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Just leading on from that, I don't, normally I just ask a little bit about what your take is on um, just general childhood activity, mm -hmm. activity levels, obviously childhood obesity is always on the agenda, but also now obviously just inactivity, I mean, get active sports that, <laughs> says everything but inactivity of children obviously is coming out of lockdown what's your kind of take on it as a whole in schools and, and um, children to get more active and healthier a couple of things on that so from lockdown which I'm, i know is, is a knee-jerk reaction to the pandemic that's happened but from our point of view we've seen particularly upper key stage two so years five and six they've lost their interest in sport it's becoming a lot harder to engage than we found in our right. schools um coming out for pe I forgot my peak. Oh, I don't want to do this. Don't want to do that. It's it's proven really tricky to get them involved. The younger children are fine, but I think for the older children, they've got so used over the last year of not playing any sport or not being able to even go outside, kind of thing. They're just used to sitting down, playing like whatever they're doing. Not every single child, but we've seen that across the board that it's becoming a lot harder. Our coaches mentioned oh, this year six are really struggling to engage them, really, really struggling. So they just have to be creative of what they're doing. Um, which I guess with those semi-sporty kids, the ones we always used to target, the semi-sporty, the ones who aren't in the teams, etc. Yeah. It's probably going to be even more difficult for them now because they're not exactly they're seeing it for you. Yeah, we're seeing a huge gulf now of children that literally haven't done anything for 12 months or so and children that can do a little bit also depends on the demographics where they live I guess if you're living in a 
you know, a one, two bed flat kind of thing, it's going to be really hard to do anything rather than just to sit down. If you're lucky enough that you've got your own garden and you can run around and do some form of activity. And um, we're seeing a, a huge goal, in, not ability, just the want and the desire to actually do form of activity, particularly with the older children. Um, but in general, I was on guy probably like six years ago. And I spoke about childhood obesity and that there's issues with it and something needs to be done. I guess that, again, I'm not a politician. I guess the government is starting to do something with regards to the hat thing and the, the PE in school sports came in after that. But more still needs to be done. There's so many things that are problems. Like if you go to a supermarket and you look at all the reduced section or the things at the end of the aisles that are always, you know, yeah. peaks. It's like if you go in the petrol station or something, you can't move for exactly. yeah. massive bags of sugar or whatever else. Is the things on offer are always your pizzas and your ice creams and massive bottles of Coke kind of thing that you get in a value pack like stuff like that needs to be changed i know i saw recently i think they're stopping online adverts aren't they for um yeah junk food ads i think it was just yesterday yeah i saw that yeah. things like that are slowly helping but then there's little things like again forgetting about the pandemic but for where we were based the, the grass on the field it sounds ridiculous but i was going out with my nephew this is years because he's 10 now years ago but we literally couldn't play football because the grass was up to his knees for me okay. and it was only up to halfway from the shin so i was all right but for him like he couldn't kick a football because the grass was too long. So yeah. it's, it's yeah. Little things like that just aren't brilliant. Like Things still need to be done and grassroots needs to be targeted more. And personally, not because I'm involved in working in schools, there still needs to be more money given to, to schools and to people, um, and particularly outside of classroom time as well. You know, schools, are, I fully understand schools' budgets have been slashed left, right, centre. But when we try to approach a school about doing an evening session, they, they want to do it, but they want to charge us a fair amount but in order for us to run it, we're going to have to get loads of children, which, as I've spoken about before, is, is really, really hard at the moment. And parents have got to spend their money elsewhere. Uh, really, yeah. those sessions should be funded or you should be able to target certain children to come and do them in the evening when there's nothing else for them to do. In terms of your experience in the industry, so from when you started to now, what kind of, um, I guess, distance travel have you noticed in terms of I know professionalism is probably a big one but what's one thing that you've noticed about how how the industry is now versus when you very first started back in let's say when you start getting active back in 2006 seven I think there's more people that want to get involved in the industry and um, definitely uh, with regards to recruitment with regards to coaching and there's more coaching qualifications for those, them to do the apprenticeship scheme which I, I'm, I'm sure we can talk about later and stuff like that is has helped that people can get actually get experience of working with children because my biggest hate is somebody goes on an FA level one course and seems to think they're a qualified coach as an FA level one takes you, I think it's two weekends. Uh, yeah. And I'm pretty sure you coach the people that are on that level one course with you who aren't five and six years old. Um, yeah. So it's completely different and trying to run certain drills that they teach is just impossible. So I think the coaching courses need to maybe reach out and offer some free services to the local clubs to say we'll come and do something for free in, in return that our, you know, the people, the candidates with us can come and do some form of coaching. But yeah, the industry is 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 changing um, with regards to people that want to get involved in it. But I still think more needs to be done to get more children involved in it and in different ways rather than just trying to force them onto after school clubs, holiday clubs that need to think outside the box and do different activities at different times. So just switching back to yourself and kind of the, I guess, day-to-day -day operations of business. I know it's going to be a lot different now to when it was back then, but what would you say back when you were kind of just starting out or scaling, what was your kind of day-to-day -day challenges that you were facing or, or one that you can remember that was a real big challenge you had to overcome? So the, the challenges were always finding the staff that I could trust when I couldn't be there, which yeah. was a little bit further down the line. But once I had those 10 after school clubs that I was running myself and I could phase somebody into them, that was fine. But then we're getting two or three other schools. So I want this session, this session, and they always want them at the same time. And you've got to put somebody else in there. But that that was the biggest challenge then is, is trusting people to go and do things and having people that can go and support them as well. Um, it certainly isn't impossible because there's some very, very good coaches out there. It's just incentivizing them and making them understand the policies, procedures and stuff like that. But that was the biggest challenge back then. But the biggest challenge now in the industry is, it sounds like a cop-out, but it really is the funding that's available to schools. If the PE and the sports, sorry, the sports premium goes at the end of this year, which I don't think anybody knows what's happening until July, which is remarkably late. Well, similar to last year as well. Yeah, yeah I think it was late, yeah, late coming up. 
I, I don't know what will happen if they pull that funding. I really don't because the schools, as I mentioned before, their budgets are so tight. That goes, then the first thing that will surely go will be all the coaching in schools. Can't see how they wouldn't be they would be able to fund it. They didn't have that support, which is a, a massive, massive worry. Not for the business, but more for what will happen with those children and how will they be inspired and how will they get all the different varieties of sports that can be offered. Because not that teachers can't do it, but it's just they've got other priorities. And speaking to teachers that work with us in the holidays, they've got so many stuff to do, so much paperwork. Yeah. They can't be doing PE as well. Yeah, and I mean, for, for business like yourself, was well established established long before this funding was around. That business model always worked, right? So the PPA cover roughly two hours a week. PE should have been two hours a week. And it like dovetailed really nicely, affordable for the schools. Really su- sustainable model. I think that's probably been maybe, um, it's got a bit of a negative tinge since the funding came out. Um, well, PE sports premium was never used. Never supposed to be used like that. It was a sustainable way of, of covering PPA cover and, and it was established well. Um for yourself, obviously established and also diversified business. You mentioned the um was it eight different companies now with the, yeah, between group. the team yeah. group. Do you want to are you able to expand on a couple of the others? I know they're really interested in terms of similar model, like business model, in terms of service delivery, etc., but slightly different vertical in terms of delivery. Yeah, so it was probably about five or six years ago, myself, Sean and Ryan we kind of sat down and said, right, Gactive's at a good place. Uh, it's expanding. But what happens if all the funding goes or if the government say no coaches in schools or, or something drastic happens? Not that we can pre- predict the future with COVID, but just something could happen that could wipe out an awful lot of this work. So we, we set up a couple of uh, different businesses. Um, so the first one that we set up was our own academy. So that is for young adults that are 16 to 19. So they come and do a, a BTEC qualification with us. And they also get to play football for three to four hours every single day. And they play against local other academies as well. So we get some really interesting characters come and join that. You know, it's, in, it's instead of going to sixth form or instead of going to college. And once they finish their BTEC, obviously they can be offered work with GAT if they want, or they can go off and do their own thing, go to university. A couple of them have gone to America in scholarships. Um, so it's a nice... Nice project. I guess that helps with the pathways. Also, elite pathway. If they are on that pathway to be elite players, then a couple of them have been signed by some professional clubs. I think by one of them signed from Marlow and one of them signed from Maidenhead. I think Maidenhead might be professional. I'm not too sure, but Marlow is semi-professional definitely. So that they're, they're getting paid to play football outside yeah. of the academy, and they're still allowed to represent the academy and be with their mates as well. So at the moment, we've got about sixty young adults that do that, and then the spin-off from doing that that we. Um, run their own BTEC is that we can run our own apprenticeship schemes and traineeship schemes as well through the academy. So we're um, you know, a registered provider for that. So that works really And is that, in terms of funding for that, is that is that ESFA kind of contract, you contracted with the government for that one? Yeah. 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 So it's, we're a prime as well, so we can get the funding direct as well. So we can, obviously following the guidelines, but we can shape our apprenticeship scheme to fit around, get active and what we believe should be happening in the industry. Um, even if they don't go on to employment and get active, they go on to employment with another coaching company. It's not a problem whatsoever. That's not why we started this, to just force loads of them to go through get active. Um, but they can get work experience with us as well, which is something I know we've touched on a couple of times that we get a lot of coaches that apply to us that have got loads of qualifications but haven't got any experience of working with children. That one works. So because the, the apprentice has just been updated, the apprenticeship's just been, been updated recently, right? So it's a level level four now is it? yeah exactly that yeah and we can i think we can go right the way up it's, it's a shame sean's not around because he, he's the expert on all the apprenticeship stuff yeah and yeah. um, that's what he does on a day-to-day basis but yeah we can go up to i think there's level five level six now um and we work with a couple of the local companies to us as well who you know who previously thought sort of their arrival i don't want to help them out but it's just helping out the whole industry so we're working with about I think it's about 20 different businesses in the local area running their apprenticeship scheme and running their traineeship scheme for them as well. So, yeah, it works really, really well. Perfect. And then I know you're looking at other areas. So you've got the alternate education programme as well and in, 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 uh, performing arts. Yeah, so the alternative yeah. vision, we call it the Alt-Prov. So we set that up probably about two years ago and it's been our fastest growing product that we've offered anything, whether it's after school clubs, beaches, holiday camps, it's been by far the fastest growing thing that we did. Um, we set that up because of our work with Get Active and we we're like, there's a lot of children here who just get taken out of our lesson, who aren't a lesson, who they're not naughty children, but when a teacher's got a class of 35 and you've got that one child at the back who's, I don't know. Yeah, it's just disturbing the class. Yeah, you can't, yeah, for a teacher, they can't focus their energy on that exactly. one child, can they? Yeah. So the, the easiest thing is 
send that child out, which is doing absolutely nothing to the child. But I fully understand why the teacher does it because they've got 30 other children they've got to try and educate and it's just impossible. Um, so we set up with the idea that we did some PE tuition with one school where we literally just took two or three children and we took them out of class and we just played football with them, to be honest. It was nothing too structured. It was the school approach that said that I know this child really struggles at home, really struggles in class. Can your coach, Mr. Hughes, he is, who's amazing, can he just look after this one child? Like, yeah, 100% will do something. And the feedback that the school got from our coach, who was literally just playing football, was amazing. Like The child was telling our coach things that the school never knew about, the family never knew about that was happening that he didn't like. And then we could feed that back to the school and then the school could use that to integrate the child back into class. And Mr. Hughes doesn't do that anymore with the child because he's in class now, which is great. And we thought, well, there's got to be some link here for these children. And my sister actually now works with the old prof, but she used to work with a secondary school proof. We knew there was loads of secondary school proofs and they're a massive thing, but we couldn't find a primary school proof in our area. I think the nearest was Slough, which is about 20 to 25 miles away. So I don't think any children really, well, a couple were getting sent over there and the council were having to pay for their taxis and stuff like that, but it just wasn't a sustainable model. So we set up our own primary school proof. We approached one of the local schools that we worked with, said, look, you've got a couple of spare classrooms. Can we use them in return? Some of your children come to us. And within two years, we're completely sold out and we're looking for other venues already. Yeah. And it's an amazing product in the fact that these children going back into education, that's the main thing that we're saying with it, uh, that we're going to use some form of, you know, integration is getting back into mainstream education. Or if they, if we make the decision that they can't go into mainstream education, we'll recommend they go to a secondary school. Again, from Ryan's background, Ryan was a teacher in a school in Slough. He was the pretty much the only male teacher in the whole of that school. So what he said was happening is he was getting, without being sexist, a boy, and they were sending them to Ryan because Ryan was the male teacher. They got excluded from a different school. He knew nothing about this child. It would literally turn up Monday morning at 9 o'clock. Here's so-and-so. He's in your class now. And he's like, all right, okay. Uh, this child's possibly got Asperger's, ADHD, got a load of problems. And Ryan's got two minutes to try and sort something out for this child. And he knows absolutely nothing about his family background, doesn't know if he's got a dad at home, doesn't know a thing. And it just did not work. So with us, our coach or our mentor, as we call them, sorry, once we put the child back into their mainstream school, mentor will go in with that child. They'll sit with that child. And they'll slowly, a bit like what we do with our new coaches, they'll slowly phase away from that child and they can speak to the teacher and can give them information that that teacher wouldn't know, like, oh, he doesn't like these noises or he can't... Certain trigger them. points and stuff like that, yeah. And therefore they can stay in mainstream education. There are a couple of children where we say that mainstream education just isn't going to work. Um, as long as we're honest with them and the schools understand and the parents understand that the reasons, then they go to their own special school and they can, you know, they can get on with their lives. So, you know, that some children... Our mentors literally go with a child at the end of the evening and they one child in red and he, they go and they walk their dog three times a week. He just walks around walking the dog, chatting to this child, making sure this child's all right. And they just see it as a you know, someone that they can speak to and someone that they can relate to as well. Um, we don't force sport upon them, but sport is something that we have in the old prob as well, something that we like to tailor their energy towards. But you know, yeah. but it yeah. breaks down barriers as well, right? That that to get just straight away to get to know someone, kicking the ball back and forth. Exactly, that. that's just that yeah, thing. open a conversation. Two weeks getting to know that child. It's not a five minute conversation before school starts. You spend two weeks getting to know every single detail we can know about that child through the school, through the child, or through the family. Um, that one works. And then the spin off from those was the uh, it's called the practical approach, which is kind of the same thing as the alt prop, but we use more performance arts. So that's, um, you know, we've got Brad that runs that. He's, he's amazing and it's singing, dancing, they do makeup because obviously sport's not for everybody. And it's the same sort of children. So children that are about to be excluded or are excluded. You're giving them that creative outlet to express themselves in a different way than exactly. sitting, in the, sitting in the classroom. Or the, yeah. yeah. And then we've got another company called The Pathways, which is slight resemblance of the academy that we have, but we focus more on once they get to an age where they've decided the school isn't for them, which is fair enough, the school isn't for everybody, we help them go on the correct pathway. So bricklayers, plumbers, builders come in and they can give them some voluntary work so they can work out what pathway they want to go on and we help them with that as well and we support them with that. That tends to be for children that aren't in education at all. Uh, right, and you're talking, uh, what age group are you talking about, 14, 15, 16? It's, it's normally 14 plus. Yeah, so that yeah, we had one child who hasn't been in school for nearly a year now and he just sits at home and doesn't do anything and we've got him on a bricklayer's course and hopefully in the next few months he'll get a job as a bricklayer, which, you know, it's a sign of we're trying to get there before something really bad happens, if you know what I mean. 
So we yeah, that intervention is a point. Yeah, to, yeah, before something nasty happens, we get to them and we can get them in onto the right pathway. And then, sorry, we have, we have two others as well. And the easy one is uh, teacher major, which is exactly the same as get active, but apart from sport, right. and music. Okay, structures, and that works really well with the synergy of the holiday camps that we can do music, and with the uh, with the um, old prop, we can use the. So with teach major, we can use the stuff for drama, music, and stuff like that. So we can offer a little bit of everything. And then the last one, which is which is slightly different, is the positive impact, which is definitely geared towards year 11s plus. And that is Nigel and with our support going into schools, speaking about anti-knife crime, county lines, right. drugs and stuff like that. Uh, again, the impact that that's had for some of these children is just phenomenal. Some children. Yeah, so you're using that platform, like you've got that network and platform schools. So it's almost all these these different programs that you're able to deliver, leveraging that that experience you've got engaging with kids at schools. It's yeah. fantastic. I've got one question that looking at all of that, how do you stay on top of um, your daily routine? Or, or I know you said earlier on organization, organization. How, how do you do it? I've got to fit in around a goal for that as well. So it becomes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so. No, it honestly is all about organization. And I'm, my wife will tell you because she's annoying annoying about me is I'm an early bird I will get up early and do all my admin because at five six o'clock hardly anybody else is awake so I get on and I just do it all so replying to all emails getting everything done one of my pet peeves with our managers is, oh, I didn't get that email I haven't had time to reply to that email fortunately there's a way you will make time if it's important to you so get up early every single morning and crack on with two hours of admin before anybody else is awake um, again, the staff will probably tell you it's quite annoying because I send emails at 5 a.m., 4 a.m., send WhatsApp yeah. at 5 a.m. Just tell them to put their phone on silent and wait till work starts kind of thing. But I just get ahead of the game, really, to be honest. And yeah. as you say, as I mentioned before, just organisation is key to the whole thing. Plan miles ahead. Make sure we know when all the staff are off. Make sure we know when certain children are coming in. But obviously, with working in schools, there will be the slight hiccup or the slight change that one child, looking more at the old prop sort of stuff, one child's done something wrong say he, he needs to be out tomorrow kind of thing or he's going to be excluded from the school so we, again we'll, we'll make we'll make it work for them so there's always fires you've got to fight but yeah no i love that getting up early to win the morning win the day attitude uh, exactly that. Clear, clear the inbox yeah there, there, there's always something that can be done like whether it's i don't know a business plan or a cash flow forecast or whatever's happening particularly what's been happening with covid i reckon every single morning i did a different cash flow or a different budget kind of thing because things were changing every single day but it's just one of those things that has to be done it's the nature of the beast of running the business to be honest isn't it definitely so looking at that and, and kind of your routine and stuff now what do you think or who do you think you've had to become from it's not my last question from when you started out in business to, to now how have you kind of changed your approach or, or who do you think you've had to become to manage multiple businesses um different board meetings and partnerships as you are now i think i had to understand where the staff are coming from and understand they have a different work ethic potentially to myself um i mentioned that i message them four or five in the morning not that i ever crack the whip or anything like that i'd like to think i don't I've got to understand that people have got other things to do rather than work so you've got, you've got to understand you're not going to get a response at that time yeah. um and trust the staff as well trust the staff that's the reason that we employ them that's the reason that we do so long of induction period with them that we've got to trust that they know what they're doing and and they do um therefore honestly hand in heart say we've got some of the best staff that we've ever had and our office team is the best office team we've had, ever had and coincidentally it's the youngest office team we've ever had so it's putting the trust in them as well before we're always oh we need to get someone that's got all this experience kind of thing which is fine but right now we've got the youngest office team we've ever had and they're so good it's so efficient in, in what they do last question from me rob yeah. is if you could go back to uh when you just leave in university and deciding what you're going to do with your life, etc., what what piece of advice would you go back and, and tell yourself? Follow your gut. It's always right. Just go ahead and do it. If you've got an idea and you think you can do something or you can make an impact, just go ahead and do it and it will work out. And one of my main theories is always get, get the work, then work it out. Don't worry about, oh, I haven't got this, I haven't got that. Go and find the work, get the work, and you'll find the solution to it no matter what it is. Like if you get a school that says, I want five days of PE teaching to start next week, you want to have that problem rather than not having any work and worrying about, oh, I can't do this, can't do that. Just go and get the work and then you'll find a solution. There's always a solution. Fantastic. Rob, thank you so much for giving up all your time no this, uh, this morning. Pleasure to be on. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's show. You can subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can write to us at dryphase.podcast at coordinate.cloud, tweet us at coordinate sport. Or follow us on Instagram at coordinate underscore sports. 
or on my account at James underscore Ventures. This episode was produced by Nancy Kwamboka with support from Claire Goodchild and Lola Small with special thanks to Rochelle. I'm James Moore and you've been listening to The Drive Phase from Coordinate Sport. 